Welcome to the Talent Grow Show, where you can get actionable, results-oriented insight and advice on how to take your leadership, communication, and people skills to the next level and become the kind of leader people want to follow. And now, your host and leadership development strategist, Haleli Azulai. Hey there, welcome back to the Talent Grow Show. I'm Haleli Azulai, your leadership development strategist with episode 30. This time we have Bob Berg. Bob asks, Is there a difference between taking leadership and giving leadership? And if so, does it really make that big of a difference in your ability to lead? He says yes to both of these. I am so excited to introduce you to Bob Berg. You probably have heard about him. You've probably read his now classic books, The Go-Giver, and before that, Endless Referrals, and uh, his book brand new book is The Go-Giver Leader. And we talk about the five keys to leadership, to great leadership that he describes in that book. And the difference between the go-giver leader philosophy of leadership and many other leadership approaches, Bob really has a unique bent on how he looks at all human interactions and definitely a suggestion for how you can be more influential as a leader with authentic connection with people. We even get into uh, your ultimate goal as a human being and the requirement for how to live a happy life. Bob does talk about what he thinks the biggest mistake leaders make is and how to overcome it. And he gives a great actionable tip at the end that I think will really stretch you. So I look forward to sharing this episode with you and to hearing from you what you thought about it and your feedback. I hope that you'll stick around and leave me comments on the webpage for the podcast. Without further ado, here we go. Episode 30 with Bob Berg. I am back here with my guest, Bob Berg, and I'm very pleased that Bob has agreed to share some of his insights with the Talent Grow Show listeners. He is a sought-after speaker at company leadership and sales conferences, and he has shared the platform with everyone from today's business leaders to broadcast personalities and even former U.S. president. He is the author of a number of books on sales, marketing, and influence, and he has sold over a million copies and was recently named by the American Management Association as one of the top 30 most influential thought leaders in business. Bob Berg, welcome to the Talent Grow Show. Well, thank you. It's so great to be with you. I always love speaking with you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Bob and I uh, met, I can't even remember how exactly we met, but several years ago, Uh and we have kept a professional friendship, and I look forward to one day meeting you in person. Likewise. Yeah. Before we get started, I always ask my guests to give a very brief overview of their professional journey. Where did you start? How did you get to where you are today? I think that gives a really great kind of context for our listeners. Uh, Began in broadcasting. I started out in radio and then I was in television. I was actually the uh, late night uh, news guy for a small ABC affiliate in the Midwest US. Uh, I was really not very good at it though. I could read the news, but I certainly wasn't a journalist. I was 24 years old, didn't really have an understanding of the news. And really at that age, I I didn't really care. So that that doesn't make for a good journalist. Uh, So I quickly found myself in sales. I like, I, I like to say I graduated into sales. And the challenge there for me was that I, I didn't know anything about sales. <laughs> and so, and the, the um, training that the company provided I was first with was negligible at best. So I was kind of on my own. Uh, I floundered for a few months and I, I, I then went to a bookstore and I uh, started coming across books by people like Tom Hopkins and Zig Ziglar and others. And I began studying them. And in a very short period of time, my sales began to go through the roof. And it, it's important, I think, because it shows that if you, if you have a system for doing something, if you learn how people have done it, uh, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. The wheel's already been invented. So long as you kind of plug in to what someone else has already done, so, so long as their, their values are similar and, and, uh, uh, and so forth, I think you, you have a lot better chance at going uh, a lot further a lot faster. That's and so, yeah, and so that worked for me. I worked my way up to sales uh, manager of a company. But the challenge with that was I really didn't know anything about leadership. 
I was a good producer. You know, I was a good salesperson, but that, that doesn't necessarily translate into being a good leader. So uh, it, it kind of uh, surprised me <laughs> that I was very ineffective <laughs> in, in what I was doing. And I think it's at that point that I realized leadership was something I was going to need to learn. It wasn't a matter of being a natural leader or, or something along those lines. So uh, since that time, I, so uh, anyway, I, I really, while leadership has never been the focus of my professional career in terms of teaching it, it really it's been sales and marketing and personal development. And I've been doing that now for close to 30 years and it's been a blast. I love doing it. I've really always been, or since that time, still been a student of leadership and grown a lot in that area. It's a, a topic of real fascination to me. Wow, great. And you have just recently mm -hmm. released a new book that is, I believe, aimed at leaders, which is called yeah. The Go-Giver Leader. Yes. So very interesting that you're moving in the direction of, you know, you say you don't teach leadership, but now you clearly do. Oh, right. Well, it's, well, it's funny how that's sort of morphed because <laughs> The Go-Giver itself, which I, I co-authored with John David Mann, a fantastic, uh, fantastic writer, and it's a story, it's a uh, par business parable, and that came out uh, uh, basically 2008, it hit the bookshelves, and it's, um, and it's really, it's connected with people, and it's been a, a fun ride with that book, and the, the main character was, was Pindar, he was sort of the main mentor, if you will, and uh, while, the, while that book was geared more toward the salesperson, the entrepreneur, there were still a lot of leaders who read that book mm -hmm. and, and put that book through their organization and really saw it as a leadership book. And uh, even though that's not what it was intended to be, people would ask, well, so how does the go-giver itself, how does that apply to leadership? How does the basic premise, see, the basic premise of the go-giver was simply that shifting one's focus. And that was really the key, shifting their focus from getting to giving. In this case, giving meaning constantly and consistently providing value to others uh, is not only a nice way to live life and conduct business, it's a, a very financially profitable way as well. So we can take that message and in a sense, that's exactly the core message of the go-giver leader, that shifting from, a, from an I focus or a me focus and moving that to an other focus creates a more powerful, lasting form of leadership. Mm. So do you think, is that the key difference between your perspective on leadership and leadership development as compared to most of the other books out there? Or are there other ways in which your way of developing leaders is different? Well, I don't think it's a matter of it being different uh, in philosophy, if you will, from other leadership books out there. I find most books on leadership uh, that are on the market right now do a fantastic job of of having this kind of focus. You know, many of them do. Uh, I think the biggest difference with John's and mine is that ours is in a story form. And there are others that are also, you know, <laughs> fantastic as far as that goes too. But this just happens to be our, you know, our story that we've written. But I think there's a lot of great books on leadership. I think what many of these books do is they talk about the difference between what many people traditionally think of as leadership, which is that sort of top-down command and control. It's all about me. <laughs> you know, yeah. You're here to make me look good, right? <laughs> and to be a go-giver leader means that you know you're charged with a huge responsibility, and that is to serve others, to focus on bringing exceptional value to those you, you lead. First and foremost, a go-giver leader understands a great leadership is never about the leader, but rather about everyone whose lives they have the opportunity to touch. Yeah. And I believe that in your book, you summarize that into five keys, right? So there are these key lessons that you're teaching mm -hmm. in terms of what makes legendary leadership. I'd love for you to briefly describe them because I think people hopefully will go and buy your book, right? The Go-Giver Leader, which we're going to link to in the show notes. But just uh, while now they're on their run or they're commuting to work or they're doing the dishes, what are those five keys? Sure. Well, the first three, to me, are the basic dimensions of good leadership, the, the big view, if you will, that guides the, uh, the enterprise, the nuts and bolts feel that grounds it and the people who are the enterprise. Number one is to hold the vision. Uh, this simply means it's the leader's job to always have the big picture in mind, the long-range view, 
to know where the enterprise is going. Uh, now, the uh, the big thing here is that you've got to hold this vision not when things are easy. It's easy to hold a vision. It's easy to have the vision and easy to hold the vision when things are going well. It's what happens when things start going sideways, which in business they're going to. Mm-hmm. And it's really the leader's job to to respond to these things as opposed to reacting and make sure that not only are they holding the vision, but they continue to hold that vision and communicate that vision. And, and that's, you know, that's the really important. That's the macro view, the, the big vision. Yeah. Now, number two is to build your people. Now, this really means nothing more than it's the leader's job to always remember that whatever the enterprise does, whatever it sells, whatever its products or services are, whatever it's about, really it's fundamentally about the people. Uh, we often hear that, right? And we, you know, we hear the CEO saying, well, it's a, you know, our company is about our, our people are our greatest assets. Yeah. And, and yet 75% of the people in the workforce today, certain surveys say, are very unhappy at work. So obviously that message is, is not either getting across or it's not really being lived from the leadership level. But really, when you think about it, building widgets, building a portfolio, building equity, that's all important, certainly. Cash flow, it's all important. But none of those, none of those is as central to the actual health of the enterprise as building the people who make up the enterprise. Without those people, you've, you've got no enterprise. Exactly. And, you know, I think it was Herb uh, Kelleher of uh, Southwest who was the first person to really shift the paradigm of importance from stockholders first, customers second, employees third. And he said, no, no, it's your employees first. It's your employees first, the customer second, the stockholders third. Why? I mean, it's not just you know, softy, feel-goody stuff. I mean, Herb's company, Southwest, has been profitable, except for I think their first year, they've been profitable every single year in business, 40 years now or whatever, in, a, in an industry where practically all the other airlines uh, lose tons of money every single year. So obviously what he's saying has some reason yeah. to it. Well, think about it. When you take care of your employees, when they feel safe, when, and uh, Simon Sinek talks about this in his great book, leaders eat last, about the circle of safety, about allowing, helping them to feel safe, to to know the leader has their back. Mm -hmm. When they feel that way, they're going to take good care of the customer. And when they take good care of the customer, the customer is going to come back and they're going to tell others. And when that happens, then the stockholders are very happy. So it makes a lot of sense to put your people first, to really build your people. Yeah. Oh, I love it. And, you know, survey results also show that the number one reason people leave companies is because they don't feel like they're being developed or, you know, nurtured. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's not the money. The money is important, but that's not the most important thing to, a, to an employee, typically. Number three is to do the work. Now, this is basically the opposite of number one, which was the macro view, right? Hold the vision. This is do the work. It's the leader's job not only to see this the big picture, but also the small picture. That is to have a solid feel for the nuts and bolts of what the enterprise does. A great leader never expects others to do something that she wouldn't do herself. Uh, She's never afraid to roll up her sleeves and get her hands dirty. She may be positioned at the top of the enterprise, but she never sees herself above the others. Mm Now, the fourth key touches upon the heart of the organization, its, its soul, if you will, and that is to stand for something. This means that the leader always stays firmly rooted to some kind of moral core of the enterprise. Uh, business is about compromise. It's about being adaptable, but there are some things on which you simply cannot and will not compromise. Uh, there's, a, a, you know, there's a saying I wish I made it up because it's such a fantastic saying. I wish I knew who did make it up, but it's be flexible on strategy, but immovable on principle. Mm. And leaders who do that are respected and they're followed. You know, in the, in the story, Aunt Elle, the main mentor in the Go-Giver Leader, she says to Ben, the protege, she says, what you have to, to give, you offer least of all through what you say. Of course, what you say is also important, but, but least of all through what you say. More importantly is what you do, but most importantly is who you are, Mm. right? And who you are is what? It's your character. So 
a leader who has a firm grasp on all four of these leadership traits or perspectives is going to be a strong, excellent leader. But, and this is, I think, the point of our book. These four alone aren't enough for truly lasting, profoundly effective, what we call legendary leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, and that brings us to, to key number five, and that is practice giving leadership. Again, we mentioned earlier the core message of the go-giver shifting from, from getting to giving, focus on providing value for others. That's what the go-giver leader does. They make it about their team. You know, it's so, it's so easy, it's so tempting for a leadership position to be something one sees as sort of a personal asset, a stepping stone towards building their own resume, their own reputation, their own portfolio. We would say that a go-giver leader operates day-to-day, moment-to-moment from the perspective that this leadership position is simply a way to help build, promote, enhance, and prosper the enterprise and its people first. Practice giving leadership can be taken two ways. There's giving leadership, which is the noun. It's a type of leadership. It's giving leadership, right? And then there's also the verb part. You're practicing giving leadership. You're not just thinking it, you're not just saying it, but you're practicing it all the time. Mm, I really like that. So something that you say, I know, I know personally is true about you, is that you're an advocate, supporter, and defender of free enterprise yes, and, and free markets and individual liberty. And I think that this is something where someone who doesn't know much about you or about this would even say that this could seem as a contradiction. And I believe that's something that you and I both try to do is to help people see that it's not about self-sacrifice to be giving. Right. And there is so much to be earned by giving. I think that this, in your career, you have really um, exemplified this and, and are doing a great job of promoting this message. What do you say to people who seem to have this confusion about, and, and it comes from our culture, which gives tons of right. confusion to anyone who wants it, right? About whether, who's, where should you focus on yourself, on others, or what? Right. Well, that's a fantastic, fantastic point to bring up. You know, law three in The Go-Giver, in the original book, The Law of Influence, says your influence is determined by how abundantly you place other people's interests first. What? How could that be? You know, isn't that, well, okay, first, if you look at all the great leaders out there and the top influencers and the most successful top money earning salespeople, this is simply how they run their lives and conduct their business. They are always looking for ways to bring value to others. But as a qualifier, when we say place the other person's interests first, we certainly do not mean you should ever be anyone's doormat, mm. to be a, uh, be a martyr, or uh, to what you said I thought was perfect, or to be self-sacrificial in any way, shape, or form. Absolutely not at all. Anything you do, any value you give to others should never be at your own cost. It should always be as a way to build everyone in the process. In the original book, Joe, uh, Joe the protege, was taught a very basic lesson, and that is that all things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those people they know, like, and trust. Uh, people will also follow people they know, like, and trust. They will want to be in relationships with people they know, like, and trust. They will allow themselves to be influenced by those people they know, like, and trust. And there's no faster, more powerful, or more effective way to elicit those feelings toward you from others than by moving so genuinely and authentically, moving from an I focus or a me focus to what we call an other focus, looking to, as Sam, one of the mentors told Joe, make your win about the other person's win. If I may, can I put this in the sales context for one moment? Sure, go for it. Why it's so important. But of course, this is also in the corporate context and as a manager, as an up and coming leader, same thing. But I often, when I speak at a sales conference, one of the first things I say is, nobody's going to buy from you because you have a quota to meet. Right. They're not going to buy from you because you need the money and they're not going to buy from you because you're a really nice person who thinks they should have your product. They're going to buy from you because they believe that there's more value to them in doing so 
than in not doing so. And that's the only reason why anyone should buy from you. In his classic, How to Win Friends and Influence People, Dale Carnegie wrote, and I think this was the underlying premise of his entire book, he wrote, ultimately, people do things for their reasons, not our reasons. Mm -hmm. So if you want to influence others, if you want to sell more, lead better, what you want to do is you want to tie in, tie together what, what you want with what that other person wants Mm -hmm. and the focus needs to be on what do they value because value is always in the eyes of the beholder so if you want to do the best you can for yourself the best thing you can do is place the other person's interests first but again when we say this we don't mean at your own expense we mean in such a way that both parties grow both parties win yes yes so there is a win-win exchange Always. or trade of value and exactly. value is perceived by each party and your job as a leader salesperson or or really just a human on earth is to always figure out how can i make this trade feel fair to both of us exactly exactly and you know i think that the key is that uh, like when you were describing the principle from the go-getter about influencing, you know, people could twist that to be manipulative, right? If they remove that part where you said you need to be sincerely interested in the other person's interest, rather than just try to manipulate them to like and, you know, to like and trust you to get them to do something. So you have to have that core authenticity and genuineness and and being a good person. And in what you described from the go-giver leader, I believe that that's probably key number four, where you hold on to principles so that you're not doing this in a way that is ever unethical or puts into question your motives or that in any way twists what's in the best interest of the organization. It's both and. Right. Exactly. It's not an either or, it's an and. Uh, You know, and when you said about authenticity, well, law number four in the go-giver is the law of authenticity. Ah, There you go. And the principle number four in the go-giver leader is stand for something. So it's always got to be character-based. And remember, if one's character is high, then doing something that is manipulative or untrustworthy is actually not even in their best interest because it's contrary to their value system. And in order for us to be happy as human beings, and happiness is our ultimate goal as a human being, everything we do is, is to be happier, right? There's nothing we do other than that we think or hope or believe it has a better chance of bringing us happiness. Mm-hmm. And to be happy, you must live congruently with your values. Amen to that. So we're all a work in progress and uh, you and I both deal with leaders who are developing themselves and we ourselves are developing. So from your vantage point, can you name one common mistake that you see leaders making that you believe you can help them avoid or sidestep or overcome? Well, I think the big thing with a, with a leader, if a leader does make a mistake, it's not realizing that that they they need to be focused on the other person. Uh, you know, I think that the biggest mistake a leader makes is thinking it's about them. Yeah. And one of the things we say in the book that Aunt L, the uh, mentor, teaches Ben, is that if you take the word lead, L-E-A-D, one of the biggest mistakes that leaders make is unconsciously transposing the L and the D so it becomes D-E-A-L and they think they're the deal. <laughs> and as soon as the leader thinks they're the deal, that it's about them, that it isn't about those they're leading or those they're serving, now all of a sudden, well, you, you look around, you don't have people following. Mm. Okay, good. So it's not all about you. Well, Bob, I always hate this point in the interview because I feel like the time is ticking away and we have to wrap up. Before you give a specific action that you recommend listeners take, tell us something that's new and exciting for you. Is there a project, a discovery, research, something that's got your attention now, I guess, aside from book promotion. Yeah. Well, the, yeah. And, we, and we've been doing a lot of promotion on the, the, the new book, but we also have a, uh, we have a certified go-giver speaker program where we teach people how to become professional speakers and speak on the topic of the go-giver, uh, the go-giver leader, endless referrals, ultimate influence, the, you know, my, my different uh, intellectual properties, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then also we have a, a podcast that's been uh, just going really, really well and very exciting about, very excited about that. 
Yeah, it's great. I like it. I like the format of it. It's, it's a lot of variety in a short amount of time. Uh, thank you. Cool. Very good. All right. Well, I always want people to leave with something super actionable because, you know, having insights and ideas from you is good, but taking action is best. So what do you think is one specific action that listeners can take today or this week to upgrade their leadership skills? Well, you know, it's a it's an interesting question because action really is a key. When we say the go-giver, a lot of times people, if they haven't read the book, they think the opposite of a go-giver is a go-getter, but that's not true. We want people to be go-getters because people, go-getters take action. And with the opposite of a go-giver is a go-taker. <laughs> so we want people to be both go-getters and go-givers, just not go-takers. So, so I would say, you know, take one of the, one of the uh, first principles, maybe hold the vision which as a leader you need to do, and come up with your own vision. If you're growing within an organization, if you're growing within a company, what, what's your vision that you see for yourself within the company, and what's the vision you hold for the company? Or if you manage a team of people right now, what's your vision for them? And, and then think, how do I obtain buy-in from them? How do I attain commitment to this vision as opposed to their having a sense of compliance, which never really works. So work on the vision and, and attaining buy-in. Great. I love that. Let's make it a little more concrete. So what would you recommend in terms of the, the length or the sort of the, how, how far in the future would make a good vision? You know, if they're going to sit down and think about this, what would you tell them to think about one year, two years, five years, 10 years, forever? Uh, yes, that's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, we, we, we need to have that long-term vision, if you will, that long-term, those long-term goals. But I think we also have to break them down and, and ask ourselves what they might look like in 20 years, 10 years, five years. And remember, there are, vi there are visions for different things in our lives. There's, sure, there's financial, there's also physical, spiritual, mental, emotional, social, company, what have you. So I, I think what, whatever... You know, I'm always a little wary of saying, you know, do this right here and do it exactly like this because I really want people to kind of have their own idea of what they want to do, but then do it within a, um, do it within the context of setting that vision. So yeah, I, I like the long-term vision, the medium ones and the short, short-term ones. Okay, good. Well, I think that's totally doable. So I appreciate you sharing that and I hope that people will take you up on that offer and take that action so that they can upgrade their leadership skills. And uh, Bob, before we wrap up, how can people learn more about you and stay in touch? I'm going to link to everything in the show notes, but what's the best way to stay in touch with you? Sure. They could go to, to either Berg, B-U-R-G dot com or our new website uh, is uh, thegogiver.com. And that has sort of everything there. And it's go giver without the hyphen in this case. So it's just thegogiver.com. And while there, they can scroll down, uh, get the first chapter uh, or a sample chapter and uh, or an excerpt of uh, either of my books. And they can connect to the uh, podcast and connect with me on social media and uh, have some fun. Yeah. And I can tell you that, you know, Bob is responsive to social media because I think that that's probably how we connected initially. In I think life. so. I, I seem to recall that. But, you yeah. know, when you've been friends with someone for so long, you kind of forget how you met. So I'm not I exactly did. sure. I forget how, but I'm glad that we did. Oh, me too. Thank you so much, Bob. I've appreciated everything that you've shared here. I think it's great, great value to folks. And I hope that everybody will go get your book, go uh, listen to your podcast and stay in touch with you because you bring a fantastic value to the world. And so in the meantime, and until the next time, make today great. Thank you, Bob. Now your job is to go do that, which Bob just suggested you do, because only taking action can actually make a big difference, right? Not just thinking about it. So thank you for listening. Don't forget that if you leave a review for the show on iTunes, it helps more people discover this content. And since I created anyway, I would love to reach as many people as possible. Of course, one of the most direct ways for you to get more people to get this content is to just directly share it with people that you think might get value from it. So shoot them an email with a link to the podcast page, which is talentgrow.com forward slash podcast forward slash episode 30. If you want to give them this particular episode, or of course, if you want to just give them all of the episodes, you can just forward slash podcast and they'll get it. 
or you can tap them on the shoulder and show it to them on your phone or hey, maybe even help them download it on their phone if they're not sure how to do it. Because my goodness, I would love to help more people. I'm Halalia Zulai. I'm your leadership development strategist, and I am so grateful that you have listened, and I hope that it has been valuable. I would love uh, whatever feedback you have to share on the show notes page where I have all the links to everything that we've discussed, and there is also, of course, where you can put comments. So uh, share what you've decided your vision might be, or talk about something in the episode that struck your fancy or a reaction from you, and any time that you have any feedback for me, that's a great place to put it. Until the next time, make today great. Thanks for listening to The Talent Grow Show, where we help you develop your talent to become the kind of leader that people want to follow. For more information, visit talentgrow.com.